For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. Welcome to His House of Learning, Flourishing Schools Part 3, Christian University Ecumenical Ethics. This is your host, Christian M.C. Fulmer. This is the third and likely final part of the series, because we got to move on to other things, as far as the Lord's leading. I wasn't even quite sure about how to continue this one, to wrap this one up, considering Cardis, you know, the, the research, as well as research, as well as a program partner with that of, as we've already discussed in part one, ACSI, Association of Christian Schools International, and the Church of England, the Anglican Church. Well, since it's, it includes, Cardis includes, quote, quote, Christian churches and schools, nonetheless, it's not, officially speaking, even considered itself a religious institution. So hence, I figured, hmm, it's best to uh, deal with those within the, the walls, so to speak, within the house. I shouldn't, I should either be uh, reconsidering, repentant, or should just leave. And then I came across quite a bit of information in regards to just how much flourishing, there's also in the, in the language of thriving and character education has gone into really a large number and a fair number of prestigious research-based quote-unquote Christian universities as well. I'll be featuring three, I will mention others, but I'll be featuring three in particular. First up is Grand Canyon U University, based right here in Phoenix, Arizona. Well, I'm outside of Phoenix, but uh, for for us here in, the, in my new home state as of this summer, oh my, <laughs> oh, four years. As of four years, and Phoenix is is the city, followed by Tucson, and then Flagstaff, and then after that Prescott. There's debates on tiers, but whatever. That's leave that for Arizonans to to uh, to decide. And GCU is competing for one of the largest and most expansive. Christian universities in the country, competing in the top three against the likes such as Liberty University. I mention them because they are independent from the CCCU, the the the, uh, the, the uh, coalition of Christian colleges and universities. Sorry, the council, the council of Christian colleges and universities, independent from them, yet still quite independent procedures on their own. Matter of fact, did you know that GCU, Grand Canyon University, actually has stock, yes, stock in the official American stock market? Yeah, look into it. It's quite something, really. They are, it is, they actually, they actually, years ago, tried to maintain non-profit status. <laughs> oy, oy. Anywho, and the following will be two representatives of the CCCU. And that will be Baylor University in Waco, Texas, and Pepperdine U University in, well, uh, it's in Malibu, California. Like I said, I'll mention quite a few across the country that are indirectly linked, or not so much as we can tell, but nonetheless, the, the psychological paradigm that is flourishing alongside similar matters of, th th of thriving and character education all are c connected they're all within the same vein and yes there are a number of christian colleges and universities that have can't really find any signs of them adopting this seems like some have introduced others seems they're ignorant of it of course there's other reasons why you should be wary you should be cautious very discerning when it comes to quote unquote Christian higher education but by all means if they're involved in this I say stay clear because this is indeed a direct sh shoot with 
what I've been talking about, the public-private partnerships between that of government, national and international, along with the private sector, as well as NGOs and nonprofits, all collaborating together with what looks like aiming towards a one-world system, and in the title, Ecumenical Ethics. This flourishing, as I've already shown, and I will show, be showing more so now, in the words of these in institutions, I go straight for the horse's mouth. But before I get started, the key thing is this. What is ethics? What is the base of ethics, of virtue, of character? Our opening passage comes with First Chronicles chapter 16, verses 8 through 17. And this is the words of King David after a victory involving the, the Ark of the Covenant. Give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O ye seed of Israel, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Be mindful. This is a very important word. Remember, we're talking about psychological paradigms. Be mindful always of his covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, even of the covenant which he made with Abraham and of his oath unto Isaac, and hath confirmed the same to Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. And according to the words of Christ, fulfilled in the prophecies and further confirmed affirmed by the apostles, by the early church after his ascension into heaven those redeemed by the blood of the Lamb that is our Lord Jesus Christ the Son of God who imparts to us his Holy Spirit we are grafted in us Gentiles are grafted in into Israel, for Israel was not meant to be a matter of blood, but a matter of the heart, a matter of the spirit, of the soul. And yes, blood indeed is a, can be a, quite a benefit, especially when it is the blood of your fathers, to impart this covenant unto you. Nonetheless, there are many people who rejected this covenant amongst the house of Israel, amongst the ethnic background of Israel. And regardless, upon repentance, they will be brought back into the fold. There's a, quite a bit of controversy in regards to, well, the, you know, the taking up, what we call the rapture, or the time of the tribulation. But what is known for a fact is those who are followers of Lord Jesus Christ, Jew or Gentile, well, they will be recognized by him. They will be received by him. There's other unique promises given to those of the seed, the biological seed. But nonetheless, the spiritual promises and judgment of the Lord God still hold. For the Lord is not impartial. Sorry, the Lord is not partial. Oh my goodness. Ugh. The Lord is impartial to all men. Jesus Christ himself, himself said, You call yourselves sons of Abraham, the seed of Abraham. The Lord will raise children. He will raise sons from stones. Those who will follow his law. Those who will accept the sovereignty of the Messiah. Give thanks unto the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. And that's just not those within his house, but those outside, among the pagan and the heathen, the, the non-believer. So, let's see what is said by 
Grand Canyon University, not too far from my backyard, realistically speaking. The major university, we're talking about thousands and tens of thousands more on an online program competing easily for the top three. In fact, in, back in 2018, it was at that, 2018 at that time, it was the largest in terms of numbers and reach. Like I said, battling out with a few others. But it's influential. In fact, they've, uh, the education department and the professional development programs have been quite proactive in their ecumenical influence. Now, I bring them up first because being a private school teacher, I've, I have had the privilege of having some access to their content. Now, sadly, quite a bit of it I cannot show you because there was a especially because there was a limitations in what could be accessed but little did I realize that within these last few months the last few weeks alone there's been updated content in the area of character development yes they have a canyon department of character education and it is uh, quite a priority for them Let's head on over and see what they have to say In regards to nature of character virtue and flourishing welcome to gcu's canyon center for character education in today's video we will be talking about character education in action Today, we'll provide an overview of what implementing character education may look like and include. Think of this as your starting point as you consider how to design character education in your organization. Before we dive into how you can start providing character education, let's recall some examples of what character education is. Character education is a comprehensive school-based approach that includes an intentional focus on promoting character virtue formation, and ethical decision-making. Before we get started, as a precursor, they're not gonna be as direct, but it is stated, it is alluded to, it is heavily implied, there are inferences. As directly stated in the information, and if you have ac managed to gain access to the Grand Canyon Professional Development, it was, uh, it was actually a free, professional development online asynchronous courses and character education. Those are, I'm assuming, outdated because the information here is a little slightly different, but overall still stands, still stands. And there, they actually had the brazenness to say, and while using an AI generated voice, by the way, for, for the short little videos for each, for each uh, lesson slash module, that, Character education, the instruction of ethics and morality, that there is a universal set. A universal set. And this is, remember, this is a Christian university instructing, and this is designed for educators, K through 12. So, so, so even though you can't teach, so yeah, I mean, we live in the United States, land of free, home of the brave, you can't, you can't, you know, to talk about the Bible, Word, things of God or God in general. Definitely can reference Jesus. But nonetheless, don't worry, at least you can still teach them universal ethics. And this is what they are. And what's the standard? Well, see, this is where it doesn't change. The standard is the collective ideals of everybody. Now, individually, you choose what your character is, but in the grand scheme, it's everybody. It's a compromise, it's a melting pot, it's a final product. It's a collective ideal. For the sake of what? Individual and human flourishing. All right, but anyways, I'll leave it to here. Through school curriculum, ethos, activities, and engagement with family and community. Educators lead, teach, serve, and learn with character to promote individual and collective flourishing. See, 
right there. Educators, what is your goal? To lead, teach, serve, and learn with character to promote individual and collective flourishing. And there's no mystery what that is. It's already been explained pretty heftily in the first two parts for by the ACSI and the Church of England. And if you think it's much different here with GCU, well, not quite. Not quite. Character education aims to develop and strengthen virtues and moral decision-making because practical wisdom in self and others cultivates a society where all can live well in a world worth living in. All can live well. Cultivates a society where all can work well in a world worth living in. Does this sound like the gospel? Sound like the salvation of souls? Sound like repentance? It sound like the recognition of the sovereignty of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is um, priority, necessary, even on on the table? No, not at all. Every organization must determine their mission and vision pertaining to character education, including which virtues they value and how they'll define them with stakeholder input. So mission vision. So, people get together, so the collective, the group, man, believer, and or non-believer, decide how they'll define the, not just, no, not, not, you know, the virtues, they'll define virtues, so they'll define what is good. One cannot embark on virtue formation without first identifying the shared virtues they value as a community and developing a shared definition of each. See? In the Jubilee Center for Character and Virtues, framework shown here, character education is not just about skills and behaviors, but about a moral grounding in decision-making and using practical wisdom. Okay, so JCCV, Fun fact, the one that she mentioned that they partnered with to create this moral framework is based, this based in the United Kingdom. I find it interesting, right? You have the ACSI partnering with the Church of England, and GCU partners, partnering with the JCCV based in also the United Kingdom. Coincidence? I'm not entirely sure. I would like to say no, but I don't know enough yet. But to me, that's just a little too coincidental as far as I'm concerned. Oh, and another thing too is, if you look more into the GCU character, character education website, the intellectual virtues, moral virtues, civic virtues, and performance virtues are all based on Aristotelian ethics. So, Aristotle. I find it interesting because, you know, who's really big on Aristotelian ethics, to a degree. You know, it's a blend now these days, as well. But, the Roman Catholic Church, particularly the, the, you know, amongst the conservative, you know, wing. Aristotelian ethics. Boils down to, and this defines practical wisdom. So what you should do in practice so, so upon reflection, reflection and definition, this is what you should do in practice. And then notice, but, notice, but what's the final outcome of what you do in practice? Flourishing individuals and society. So we're back to that again. Back together then. As I say, it's full on ecumenism. Full on ecumenism. Once you start you know, practicing ecumenism within the denominations and churches, whether or not they adhere to the dictates, to the ordinances, to the laws, to the just the clearly stated words of the Lord, well then, why not just graft in? There you go. you got a false grafting, a perverse grafting. Why not graft in everybody else? Once you remove the scriptures, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's every man for himself. 
Too much or too little of any virtue can be harmful. So notice, too much or too little of any virtue. This isn't a matter of, this is the same thing as eating ice cream or drinking too much water. I want you to think about that. Virtue, doing the good, doing the right thing, is not the same as overindulging on food. For example, a character education program without a moral compass might focus on teaching resilience, but resiliency can be used in excess, such as in criminals who continue to commit crimes. That's not resilience used in excess, that's resilience used the wrong way in flux. And plus, here's the thing, resilience is not generally known as a virtue, it's generally not even known as a, generally not even known as, known as a quality of sorts. Resilience is actually, resiliency, resilience is actually part of the psychological paradigm of positive psychology, which blends itself into flourishing into uh, which also you'll hear later on about thriving and the common good that's it's all you know it's all different you know it's all different uh, feathers on the same wing so it's interesting resiliency oh yeah that's, 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 let's just use another factor another element of this psychological you know scope Instead, individuals must find the golden mean of our virtues and use that to guide in making the right choice in an ethical situation. So, I'm going to skip through it because a lot of what she does next is just, it's going to have visual text. Notice what she said, the golden mean. So remember, you got to find the golden mean of how to do good things. Does that sound... Does that sound... Some are even like remotely biblical or even remotely realistic. Well, if you well, that's the thing. No, it's a con no, not, not at all. Of course, you know, which of course it is actually just a natural byproduct synthesis of quote unquote real religious and secular, you know, ethics. You know, just a less uncertain, a less relativistic relativism. So it's you know, so like so to speak. It's this is still situational. Circumstantial ethics. Bear in mind, which is, which is a, uh, <laughs> which which is an outcome of also what we call critical thinking. I eventually, I gotta get to that. Gotta show you why critical why critical thinking. I'm thinking about critical theory. We recognize that's questionable, if not a problem. Critical thinking. Same vein, it's just more mature and more, <laughs> it's just more mature and uh, more, you know, sophisticated. Less of a nuisance, but nonetheless, nonetheless uh, muddies the waters, so to speak. It's, it's the not-so-obvious paradigm of which obscures, the, you know, the very nature of good and evil. But more on that in the future. Or in the future. Character education is not meant to be a means to an end. The purpose is not to help others develop virtues, only to fix their mindsets or behaviors, to increase their academic potential or push an agenda. Yeah, I don't know about that last one. <laughs> or to push an agenda, yeah. Let's just because here's the thing. The other one they said there's in the, in the, in the older version of this on the professional development website courses with reference to remember universal shared virtues values it's neutral something for everybody really it's not meant to push an agenda that's literally the one world system that's 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 literally the one world religion this is literally the one world religion purporting and remember, we, we've already looked through quite a bit about human flourishing and the common good. That applies to, hands down, to politics and economics. So one world government, one world economy. And why I share all this? People, this is why the Lord makes it very clear in his word. 
Do not love the world. Do not store your treasures on earth, but indeed store your treasures in heaven. Do not prior, do not worry about tomorrow. Do not bank, literally bank your life. You're the best you're going to have in life on this side of heaven. Because this is it. This is what it's all going to contribute to. And if you're going to stay faithful, it's going to be taken away. It's going to be taken away. Now, if you're... Now, if, now of course, if you, uh, put, if you invested so much of your life into this, well, then you may not be so inclined to remain a sheep. That's suspect to slaughter. All right, and let's see here. What does she say about the goal of character ed education? Goal of character education is to help individuals and society flourish. See right there, the goal. And the the other, and, there, and there's another video they do on it shorter, and then even the old one it says the ultimate goal. Just to make it very clear that this is the objective when it's all said and done. Help individuals and society flourish according to the word of the Lord. No. According to the universal consensus of the definitions of man of what is good, what is virtuous, what is valuable, there's there's thing what's 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 wrong, what's false, what's bad or evil is never going to be brought up in this. Never. That's what I noticed about when I went to Cal State LA in my graduate program years ago. The nature of good and evil is never brought up, especially anything, anything that just brought the idea of evil. Somebody may have said wrong, but as you just said, out of frust you know, f you know, f you know, frustration not with the full gravitas and meaning of the word. Let's continue on. So it's more than just a subject, people. This is a major priority for Grand Canyon University. They, they have plans for this. This is going to be at the forefront of their educational philosophy. Their education teaching program, likely. Wouldn't be surprised if eventually it made its way into or already has. It's a part of university at large. That I'm not too sure of, but... This is, uh, this is fully un un underway. Remember, this is one of the largest and most influential Christ quote unquote, Christian u universities with stock in the market. In not just the United States, but the world. Character education has a place in the culture and function of... Well, yep, family, schools businesses, and really any other institution. Should be influencing, so everything, so ever, this is, this is, bear in mind, think about this. This means, and she's gonna go over it more a little bit later, this isn't, this is a referring to the fact that the schools must partake, public and private. Okay, these are, these are instructions to teachers going into public or private education. Public or private ed education. To instruct at the bare minimum, hey, when it's all said and done, make sure that, or the goal is, make sure that you teach these people how to individually and socially flourish. If they don't accept or you don't even get to the Bible, the gospel is just forgotten, and, you know, the eternity of their souls is, you know, just bygone thing, whatever. Just make sure that you help us establish this one world system. And there's the thing, do I know when it's going to be fully implanted and then the tribulation starts eventually? No, of course not, but come on. If this isn't a part of it, I don't know what is. It's about helping students grasp what's ethically important and teaching them how to act for the right reasons, so they become more autonomous and reflective in the practice of virtue. Let's go back to 
We could, let's, go back, let's go back to David. Remember what he said? Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Let's see in verse 11. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. Verse 15. Be mindful, ye mindful always of his covenant and the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Yeah, except it's all about being autonomous. Because we're already atomized as it is already. Lonely and... It's great. It's all about social interaction. Yeah, you, yeah become more autonomous and reflective. We're going to be all individuals together. We've literally done this. We've literally already done this. And we're doing it. It's the same thing. It just repackaged. Sounds sounds nicer than the way that they said it you know, before. Like, before it was more idealistic and emotional. Now it's more... Oh no, this is science. This is science. How to act for the right reasons. So they become more autonomous and reflective in the practice of virtue. As described from the JCCV framework, character is caught through implicit modeling, taught explicitly, and hopefully sought. So you hear that? It's caught, so, you know, it's influenced by other people, it's taught directly to you, and you teach directly to people, and hopefully, when it's all said and done, you actually want to seek after it. That you actually want to grow in character. Well, according to scripture, that's uh, amongst the population at large. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Yeah. The heart is deceitful. Wicked above all things. What man can, what man can know it? Uh, I, think, I think our lives, lives individually and what we witness throughout and study of history, etc. I don't know. Don't think we're really ones who seek what is good. Considering the fact that I um, don't really know what the word good is anymore. <laughs> it's kind of a little hard to do the right thing when you don't even know what good is. Just, in, just as a word. Character taught, saw it. I'll have these in the, I'll have these, I'll have links to these in the, in the, in the description of below if you want to check it out your, yourself. And then here's a diagram in regards to all this. Everything's character, 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 you know, education. It's very, it's, it's actually reminds me kind of like of uh, Islam in a way because it's multifaceted. It's not just, it's not just natural relationships amongst, you know, amongst those who you have regular contact intimacy with. It's, you know, this is meant to be full integration of your personal life, your family, or your personal, your family, business, institutional at large. And bear in mind, all through in the video, in the old ones, the old videos from the professional development site, and these, you can, you can check it out on their YouTube page, Canyon, you know, you know Canyon uh, Character Education. There is no mention. There is not even any symbolism or representation of church, religion, God, nothing. It's quite something, really. There is no one-size-fits-all approach to character education. Yeah, every, we've been t people have been touting that. I've seen that in private and public sector. You know, people have been touting that all the time, and yet we always try to come up with something. Each organization should determine its needs, approach, and content. Whether they be saved or unsaved, it's relevant. It's relevant. doesn't matter. It's a, it's a humanitarian one world system that, that we're aiming for people okay let's see here begin with personal reflection learning and growth determine the path for the school as a community so in other words fix yourself and get together with other people and figure out what the what the you know what the you know, what the vision should be Create action plans for integrating character across subject areas and curriculum, making classroom connections, training staff, and serving students. Remember, this is a this is a full-on thing. 
Now, granted, how successful it's going to be in the grand scheme of things, I highly doubt it because, yeah, after being a substitute in what's supposed to be a school district in the 70th percentile of the state of California for a couple of years, that was like way before 2020. Years before 2020, yeah, it's. I, I. Well, I can honestly say that for a lot of schools, this is not even gonna. This is not even gonna get off the ground. It's gonna be still in its package, likely forgotten or trampled upon. So. So, yeah, but I imagine, and I already know a lot, quite a few schools are already making the actual attempt to implement this, and there will be quite a bit of influence as a result. It's the individual learning, gaining awareness, developing virtue, and enhancing practical wisdom. I remember what that's what was that practical wisdom for is for promoting the flourishing of individuals and society for the one world system. Reflecting and notice 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 this. I've, I've been remember I've been talking about there's a synthesis between left and right wing. So this seems. Fairly white right wing, if you think in a sense, because you know it's talking about morality and virtues and ethics, doing the right thing for the good of society, which is you know quasi old school classical liberal as well. But notice what's also in here too: reflecting on biases, virtue strengths and weaknesses, virtue reasoning and virtue definitions. They have quite a bit of a uh, intersectionality, reflection on biases. And virtue strains and weaknesses, virtue reasoning, and virtue definitions. You know, quite a bit of that, still a little that postmodern, you gotta, you gotta define it for yourself type of deal. You know, it's kind of like still, still using, still implementing that your truth is your truth, but you gotta make sure it's part of the collective truth too, I guess. That's compatible with collective truth. It's quite something, really. Developing a professional growth plan for enhancing individual character. Remember, this is for you, the individual. This is, and so you have this element of self-help, too. In fact, if you uh, read the autobiography, I mentioned this before, quite some time ago, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, he actually said he did something like this. Yeah, he literally did something like this, but for him, he said, yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work out. He, he essentially old-school self, self-help. So you got self-help, like a self-help element involved in this, too. Developing a plan for how to apply discernment in ethical decision making and ensuring you are advocating for diversity and, and conclusion. Sorry, inclusion. Well, the conclusion is whatever they want because it really doesn't matter what you want when it's all said and done. Yep, so here's the thing developing a plan for how to apply you know, discernment, finally a biblical term, in ethical decision making and ensuring you are advocating for diversity and inclusion. So, yeah, use discernment. Just make sure that in the end, it advocates DIE. By the way, DIE is not done here. DIE is going to be present within the other two as well. All right, let's listen to this part real quick. Including how to make character education equitable for all. See? So this is talking about leadership. Leadership. How does leadership make education equitable for, for all? Not all staff, students, and stakeholders receive character education the same way as cultures, perspectives, and experiences differ. Ensure all stakeholders have an input and a shared vision. And notice, there's also stakeholders, is once again a term used by the international you know, community organizations, NGOs as well, including the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, uh, the Human Rights Commission or something. I don't remember. There's a bunch of bunch of so-called human rights people who basically make make human living as abominable as possible. But, but yeah, so that's so as I said, it, it, it's just this blend. It's just this blend. I, I just it's, so you have all these you have all these fact. It's quite something. You have all these factions in our culture in our society at large going at each other and poking at each other sometimes even getting pretty ugly and ugly and aggressive and they could very well lay hands on each other anytime in the near future but in the middle of all that you have 
at the university level. This is beyond undergrad. This is this is a the full scale university level, as you're going to see later. This is it's not just this is not just for Grand Canyon University. This is amongst members of the CCCU in partnership. Grand Canyon non CCU member and CCCU members in partnership with the larger higher education arena. Like I said, like I said, the, it's the com, like I said, the combination of the public and private sector of the of you know, of Christian and non-Christian, left wing, right wing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The ecumenism is strong. All right, yeah, there's a bunch of other high, a bunch of other highfalutin language. Like I said, integrating opportunities for ethical decision making and planning how that will be taught. So once again, human beings. So what's the solution? We're going to define what's right together. We've already done that. It, it, it totally fails every single time. That, I mean, that's, that's literally why we're going to end up with the beast later on, eventually. Let's see. and uh, it's... All right, here we are. Leading and teaching with character includes modeling positive virtues. I did not know there was negative virtues. What they mean by positive, I guess it's active, but nonetheless, yeah, it's weird. It's weird. There's a so it's, it's tied to the philosophy of positivism as well, which is also very much part of the ecumenical, humanitarian, universalist, one world ideal as well, back from the 1800s. Anywho. This, this, this stuff has been around for a long time. The balancing of virtues is very esoteric uh, Eastern mysticism, Buddhism, Hinduism, if you will, New Agey. I said it's just a, and, and that's the thing about Buddhism in particular. We'll be doing actually members of Mystery, Mystery Babylon next part on Buddhism and how really it's integrated itself in society at large along with church and education. And this term, balancing, yeah, you need to balance good things. I should think about that. That's, there's no reference to that in the words of Christ. Balancing virtues. Yeah, the balancing virtues that you defined, because let's face it, perhaps those virtues aren't really good. Aren't really uh, on par with the law, with the word of the Lord. So you gotta balance them to make sure that, you know, one... That one thing that's not actually good doesn't cause too much you know damage, right? You know, remember we're the we're the society that works with the lesser of evils. We work with evil. So hey, you ever? I mean, we're we're the society that came up with its term the necessary evil. Like I said, it's a byproduct of, of critical thinking, people. Just gonna throw that out there before I really make my case. Hopefully in the near future. We'll see. Discuss and develop shared understanding of virtues, virtue reasoning, and moral decisions. Balancing virtues to make good decisions. Oh, finally, there's the word good. Good decisions for the betterment of society. Oh, okay, there you go. See, it's good as long as it betters society. So make sure you always do something that's good for everybody else, regardless of what it is. Use literature and assignments to teach and discuss virtuous actions and moral and moral decisions. Well, that seems pretty. It's pretty old school, right? Oh, look at this. Well, here's the finale to all this. Character education is nurturing, flourishing of human goodness. There you go. Don't yeah. Great commission, irrelevant. Gospel irrelevant. Anything in the Word of God is relevant. Yeah, it's. Remember, Christian student, Christian graduate, go to Grand Canyon University and you go out there and you make sure that you nurture human goodness. That doesn't sound satanic at all. During the flourishing of human goodness, you may feel like this is just another thing to add to your already full plate. This is how important it is. But character is not an extra. Character is the plate. 
Character education is not a project to work on or something we do in isolation. It guides us in our everyday lives and is what we demonstrate in our beliefs, behaviors, and being. It's about knowing, feeling, and doing what's ethically important. It's about knowing, feeling, and doing what's ethically sound, ethically right, ethically, no, ethically important. Notice the language you're doing. It's ethically important. Remember, this is situational circumstantial ethics. So there's probably something you should do, but it's not important for, for that time, so you gotta do something else. Oh yeah, by the way, it's society at large helps determine that. Yeah, what can go wrong? The big picture to remember... Sorry, I'm sorry for being so... Uh, it's just something, right? Just, just what a time to, to be alive. Remember is that character education is about enhancing virtues and moral decision-making to lead to human flourishing. Just in case you missed it, this is about human flourishing, as described by CSI, Church of England. And as you can tell, this has nothing to do with your soul. Or dealing with the evil that is a sin of man. Yep, just going to move on like we're innocent, like we're all right. And we're the victims, and we can do this even though we failed for over 6,000 years of human history. You already have character, so be intentional about how you model and teach it so that others can catch it, learn it, and then impart their character on others too. See, as this statement right here, so be intentional about how you may model and teach it. Go like, because you already have character. You are already, in essence, a good person. So, whether or not the tribulation happens during my lifetime, I think it will. But hey, wouldn't be the, wouldn't be the first time that some, you know, something as terrible as happened. I mean, think about this, people. The church at large is persecuted around the world. Non-believers admit that fellow brethren in Christ, those who claim to be followers or learned savior, are the most persecuted group people around the globe, outside of our borders. In the Western world, there's been an increasing number of arrests of people just reading scripture at the, in the wrong place at the wrong time. AKA people who don't want to hear it. Being arrested. They're really just standing there and just reading what the Bible says. A lot, of, a lot of them aren't even raising their voice. I kid you not. And they're being arrested on the streets. United States of America, Canada, Europe, Australia. Does that mean tribulation's coming? That means Jesus is coming back to take us up? Don't know. I don't know, but all I know for a fact is that this right here is a, is, is a sign that there's going to be a lot of people, quote, quote, who are members of the body of Christ, who are going to look at those of us who don't quite subscribe to this and be like, okay, you're the problem. Because you don't believe in human goodness, and you don't believe that we all have unique character that we can basically nurture each other with. Yep, this is, I see, I, I, this is a sign of the time. I, I can see where this is going to go. All right, let's see here. Going over to, so that was, so that, so that was from earlier this year, this month, actually, no, this month? Yeah, this, yeah, this month, wow, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that video, that, that particular video was from the, earlier this month. This is from 2021. And it's, there's, and it's still a thing. The Global Flourishing Study, brought to you by Baylor U University. And look down below, that symbol in the t bottom left is the symbol of the Flourishing Department of Harvard University. I've already shared with them with you before. Gallup, yes, the Gallup poll. And COS is 
with Council of Open Science. I didn't know too much about them, but yeah, they're 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 a non Christian organization too. Like they're they're full on don't care about the will of the Lord whatsoever. Then that is who is helping this formerly, far as I'm concerned, formerly Baptist university that still says it's of Baptist origins, still has faith in what I don't know. In 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 humanity flourishing, I guess. See what they have to say. Oh, but forehand. Let's turn our attention over to Mark chapter five, twenty-five to thirty-four. This is a story that a lot of you may know, but let's think about this. Because if anything, I'm ashamed for not thinking about this sooner. Mark, Mark 5, chapter, Mark chapter 5, starting with verses 25. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch it but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press, and said, Who touched my clothes? And the disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him, and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. And Jesus immediately knowing himself that virtue had gone out of him. The goodness, the righteousness, the glory, the holiness of the Lord God come out of him. This woman sought, as David said, sought him. Sought, she, 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 you know, she sought the word, she recognized him for who he was. He said so himself, Thy faith has made you well. Dear listeners, dear brethren, Lord Savior Jesus Christ, do you seek the Lord continually? I'm not promising, I'm not a faith healer, you know, like right there, thinking, like promising, oh, and thus you'll be healed, and thus you'll be cured, and thus you'll have such and such, and receive this. And... Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. You're seeking the Lord because, read the book of Job. Job sought the Lord, and even amidst his situation and circumstance, he was in peace. And he was still whole. And here's the thing. And before his death, the Lord, the Lord, you know, the Lord uh, restored unto him much of what he had lost on this side of heaven. For some of us, that'll be the case. For others, not so much. But that's not our concern. It's not our concern. Now, what is the concern of Baylor Un University? Partnering with those who are Antichrist, those who do not recognize Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the Anointed One. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the campus of Baylor University here in Waco, Texas, and to today's announcement about the Global Flourishing Study. It's a five-year, $43.4 million research project that will break new ground as it applies scientific rigor to measure the factors by which people and societies flourish throughout the world. At Baylor, this is the largest 
funded research project in the university's history. So it is a historic day here at Baylor. And it's a major landmark in Baylor's pursuit of preeminence as a Christian research university. Pursuit of preeminence. Yeah, fun fact, GCU, Grand Canyon University, same thing. They want to maintain their preeminence. Here's their pursuit of preeminence as a research university. Look at this, this is what it takes. Preeminence takes the approval of your fellow man, even those who are inadvertently the enemies of God. Let's go over to six. I'm getting a little better at this. Thank you, Lori. I appreciate that. It is wonderful to have all of you with us. And as I think about uh, this historic day, I, uh, I, I don't know that there's actually the right superlatives to say how elated we are for Dr. Byron Johnson, for Dr. Vanderweel, for this partnership on this uh, global flourishing study. Um, you know, our focus on research here at Baylor, our Christian mission, and our commitment to facing global challenges and trying to find solutions for those global challenges makes this global flourishing study a natural fit for what we do here at Baylor. And as most of you know, we are in the midst of a strategic plan called Illuminate that is about us becoming among the top research universities in the country while ensuring the integrity of our Christian mission. Notice the campaign is called Illuminate. I'm trying to like trying to make sure that I don't you know, talk to like a mainstream or even really even really even a closet for God matter a closet of you know you know New Age you know Truther New Age esoteric Truther. But that's the thing. There is things to this history. There is things in the history of people continually, people continually wanting to be the illuminated ones. Yeah, the, 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 the mainstream idea of Illuminati is not, yeah, it's not that viable. But the, the overarching idea, the goal of what it means to be, to, to be illuminated, to, to be, you know, to be initiated. That's that's been an ongoing thing for quite some time. People, essentially, who more formally but secretly, for sure, want to you know, want to uh, you know want to essentially usurp the Lord God, but they understand that their methods are going to be too alarming to their fellow man believer and non-believer alike. So in this in this case, this isn't really too shocking because, you know, illuminated. It is actually becoming you know, as as we have as we have become less biblical in our culture in general, those like a lot of these psychological and really even esoteric paradigms are starting to become more self evident, become more a natural part of our of our of our vernacular and the way that we structure our institutions i mean considering the fact that here's i mean here's one group of people one group of people you know the jesuits for example for example are the catholic it's catholic you know this order that has the largest number of universities in the, in this country and around the world they're big on illumination too. So, and remember, this is a part of the ecumenical movement, so you're starting to see a lot of shared language and terms, both mystical, spiritual, and secular, modern, that are going to be start to intertwine. And it's no secret that, you know, Roman Catholic Church and much of the Protestant Evangelical churches are starting to see more quote unquote eye to eye a lot of things. Well, why? Because, well, when neither side wants to refer to the scripture, well, then partnership is so much easier. Same is here in regards to a near $44 million collaborative effort for this research. 
and what's 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 the purpose of it? Well, let's face it, it's Antichrist. That's 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 the pur purpose of it. But I'll let them speak for themselves. One of the four pillars of that strategic plan is to enhance the impact, the the breadth and the depth of the research that we do on this campus. And then we have five signature academic initiatives within that strategic plan, one of which is human flourishing, leadership, and ethics. So this study fits perfectly into the work we're doing more broadly at the university to advance research and to really think about how do we help the human condition for people, for communities, uh, for nations more significantly. So we're thrilled to be able to support this project. And as much as we love the big number, the 43 million, and how significant that is, uh, certainly in the life of Baylor and in research just broadly, there Sorry, I'll go back a little for a little bit. And that's huge and very different than past studies. Uh, we believe that data from this study will reshape the global conversation on what it means to flourish. This study will reshape the global conversation when it needs to be to flourish. Bear in mind, this study. Now, here's the thing. What's interesting is that GCU is probably going to be flourishing, but remember, in an ecumenical, universalist, unitarian fashion. This is actually a, just so then you know, it's like, oh, see, look, full well, Christian, like this is not the same. No, I recognize this. In, this research includes the relationship, the effects, whatever you want to call it, causation, whatever, of religion of spirituality. It does. But here's the thing, though. Remember the coexist sticker. Still in fashion, and now it's essentially the now essentially the uh, policy of these universities. And we'll provide scientific data that researchers really around the world can use in a wide variety of fields that will really help build our knowledge and understanding uh, in this important area. And as exciting as all of that is, as a faith-based university, we also are really excited uh, that this study is going to actually examine the role of faith in human flourishing around the world. And it's going to do it across faith traditions, and not just the Christian faith, but much more broadly in other world religions as well. Much more broadly, other religions as well. Human flourishing, much more broadly. So it doesn't matter they're unsaved, that they, they are, if they're not redeemed, they could still flourish. Because remember, the goal is human flourishing. So, this is what I was, this is what I was talking about. Let's see here, let's go to, let's go to this board. Social Sciences here at Baylor and founder and director of the Institute for Studies of Religion, Dr. Johnson. You will see this man again. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Dr. Livingstone, for those kind words. You know, you may be asking, how in the world did this happen? And Tyler and I ask that question a lot. How did this happen? Um, and it began... Byron Don Johnson, PhD, Baylor University Institute for Studies of Religion. People, when it's all said and done, religion will not be wiped off the face of the earth. I mean, it's, how else do you have a one world religion, according to the end times prophecies, if everybody becomes an atheist? It's not going to happen. And it turns out, as far as I can tell, this is just my theory. But I think one of the major reasons why that it does not happen is that many members of the, quote, church are going to partner with everybody else to help promote and keep religion relevant. Rather than be wholly set apart and risk ostracization, if not persecution, well, if you can't beat them, join them. Even though the Lord clearly warned, don't do that. With a meeting sponsored 
by the John Templeton Foundation at Harvard University about three years ago, almost to the day. They brought together a number of scholars from different fields uh, and disciplines to talk about the potential role of religion in human flourishing. Uh, it was a, a three-day event, which was really inspiring and educational, but I remember at the event, Tyler and I would have conversations during breaks over dinner. And we began to ask the question, is it possible to do something that we really haven't done before? Is it possible that we could do something globally, uh, cross-country, that we could do um, with a big end size that we haven't had the, the ability to do before that would allow us to cover different religious traditions? Because most of the research is in the West, and most specifically here in the US, and it's mainly on Christian samples. Yeah, so are we doing this because we want to figure out how to better evangelize and then disciple those who come to saving faith? No, of course not. No, we know the whole point of this so we can figure out, well, how do we encourage these people to keep doing what they're doing for the sake of human flourishing? Cross country, there is probably great, the first ever cross country nationally representative multi religious longitudinal study of human flourishing. This is meant to be a five-year study, an ongoing five-year study, and, they've, and they're and still doing it. They are still doing it. Let's go ahead. 1235. Green, led by the three Templeton philanthropies that have really undergirded this, and not only that, they have helped bring other foundations to the table in a number. So John Templeton Foundation, Templeton Religion Trust, Templeton World Charity Foundation. They're, they're all associated with Harvard and the Ivy Leagues. Betster, Paul Foster Family Foundation. Yeah, they said, non-believers. Wellbeing for Planet Earth Foundation and Wellbeing Trust. These two are part of the psychological paradigm community as well, as well as you can tell, Wellbeing for Planet Earth Foundation is also, is also the environmentalist wing. David and Carol Myers Foundation, same thing, same thing. I, th I think there's, you'd be surprised how many people, how many people, couples claim to be part of part of the part of the part of the flock, part of. One of the sheep of, of, of Jesus Christ, and yet they give a lot of money to a lot of uh, a lot of uh, programs and projects that do not promote the gospel at all. In fact, are quite 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 the tools to undermine it in, in the long term. And plus, additional contributions from Baylor, Harvard, and Gallup. So yeah. So yeah, so how do you, uh, so once again, how do you rise to preeminence in in, a, in the world as a Christian university research institution? Oh, when um, people associated with the Ivy Leagues and their circles come to you offering tens of millions of dollars if you help them conduct a one world system study, essentially. You cannot love, you cannot worship God and mammon. Precedented way so that we could in fact do something that has never really been done before. So we're enormously appreciative. I think of Sir John Templeton, I had the pleasure of meeting him on many occasions where he said, we really are behind in our the knowledge that we need to understand religion and science can help us understand religion and we need to dramatically accelerate what we know and in many ways this is a project that will help us do just we don't know religion of course they don't know religion <laughs> <They're> <laughs> like we don't know anything about religion these are people who, who as a whole don't really believe in much per se well, we need science to help us. Okay. 
it's not really a shocker these people don't know much about religion these are people these are people who think that religion is a religion as a whole is a is more make believe than than Marvel and DC comics i mean goodness gracious all right so let's see here oh yeah the scope of the poll this is very interesting actually this is a representative from Gallup. The Gallup World Poll, created in 2005, world's largest nationally representative study, 96% of the world, 150,000 individuals a year, 2.5 million since 2005, will be unique by using longitudinal panel data. So the Global Flourishing Study will be unique by using longitudinal panel data. I don't really expect this to be that accurate because, I don't know, if you do any background on Gallup, the Gallup polls have always been questionable across the board, especially when it comes to political matters. <laughs> uh, it, it, when it's all said and done, I really, like I said, I expect this to be a more of a worldview, more of a value, more of a philosophical, more of a value, more of a theological influence than actually you know, really any benefit in any actual pragmatic way whatsoever because education and polling amongst other and much of the scientific com you know, community which is fraudulent yeah well there we go I mean yeah it's fraudulent so I can only imagine a lot of this is going to be padded if not if not if if not if not not even c complete it's all said and done and yet still it's going to be used as a means to oh well now we're going to implement this and if you don't comply because we did the science and and we consent to it because we defined what it is ethically important in regards to the conclusions the inconclusive conc and it's always in, in, you know, inconclusive when it's all said and done the inconclusive conclusions of this then you know, you're a traitor to mankind or something. I don't know. Anyways, you're a hater. I could, yeah, that's... Because, I mean, they've done this. I mean, they've already been doing this. It's been like... So why not just do it on a larger scale? Okay, let's see here. Full chance of being selected into the study. So that's literally face-to-face -face enumeration going going down and, and, and getting people to participate in the study. Um, the second, and, and we went through a, through a pretty impressive process of selecting our 22 countries that are in this study. We wanted to make sure we had every major religion in the world accounted for. We wanted to make sure we were in every major region and that we had a lot of different cultural and linguistic, linguistic differences. So we can truly say that we're representing half of the world's population with this study. The second part that gets a lot of times glossed over is making sure that the questions that we ask are the right ones. And you're gonna hear from Tyler. on Representing half the world's population with a quarter million people. So there's definitely room for error. I'm not saying, I'm not accusing them of anything. I'm just saying that they have a lot of work to do with a quarter million people representing half the world's population exactly what that uh, what this questionnaire what this study is going to cover but I just want to touch on the fact that for the past year we've actually been going you know into the field and we've been talking to respondents in every one of these countries to make sure that the way that we're asking them the question is well understood that the questions we're asking are relevant to their lives and 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 uh, and that we're measuring these concepts in a way that is going to be very very accurate and there are not a lot of research or survey um, efforts that exist that have gone to the depth of, of, of study and making sure we get these questions right uh, from the start. So in summary, I'll just say that this is incredibly exciting and innovative for us, and, and we really do think at Gallup it could, it could change the way we understand life on Earth. So at Gallup, we, can really, we understand the, the ways that can change life on Earth. And they mean that, okay? They mean that. They don't, they're not spending... Even if they don't do it effectively, even if it's kind of a flop in a number of ways, they mean it. They mean it. Like, that's the thing about these people is that, you know, it's all said and done, the Lord will decide what actually happens, what they actually accomplish, what they actually put, put, you know, put forward, but nonetheless, they mean it. 
claiming that this is this is the whole point. They're trying to change the world as we know it, and this is one of the tools for the long for the longitude coming down the pipeline. Or this is started in 2021, so you know, by 26, you know, it's supposed to be done. There's supposed to be some implications, some long-term implications that they are going to be that's going to be influencing you know society along the way. We'll see. I mean, I have to think about it. I mean, look at look at this collaboration so far. And if you think and Baylor, and Baylor, bear in mind, Baylor is uh, before this partnership and definitely after this partnership. It's a it's a it's a hefty player. It's a hefty player. Unless the Lord intervenes, yeah, you know there, you know we will there 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 will be residual effects from this you know, activity. All right, let's see here. Scope of the poll. Oh, let's go to eighteen thirty. All right, see, so the survey development process, selection of core religion, well-being, demographic questions. So once again, from a psychological from the psychological paradigm, psychological. Uh, self-actualization, humanistic, new agey, you know, paradigm. You know, this is, I mean, this is, like, everybody's talking about, you know, the technocracy, uh, the, you know, you know, Marxism, you know, well, neo-Marxism, uh, neoliberalism, you know, neoliberalism as new age, new world, world. I mean, it's, this is, this is a synthesis, like, this is the mix, like, they said, there's all this nonsense, there's all this, there is, there, there are conflicts, there is going to be, I mean, I'm pretty sure, because people can't just not just get antsy and go into fisticuffs and do time, I mean, it's gonna, I mean, that's, that's gonna, blood's gonna be spill over eventually, but in the meantime, there's, these people are literally, a lot of these people are literally just working to, to, to like, to, like, together and just moving along while the rest of us are scrambling, like, like, you know, like, man, and of course, it's not like they're getting all, it's not like they're in perfect harmony and kumbaya, far from it. You know, this is, I mean, this is, I mean, we're talking about people being inspired by the ambitions of the devil himself who tried to, to who tried, who, to, who tried to usurp his, you know, creator, so these people are obviously not not in good company amongst each other in the grand scheme of things. And I say grand scheme because for them it's just, that's it, that's all it is. It's just one big pyramid scheme. Ah! Freemason joke. Okay, let's move on. Content expert survey input. So imagine how much that's going to convolute things. Scholarly survey feedback. Also going to convolute things. Cross cultural and translational feedback. So, notice this. They prepped this in 2020. Cross cultural and translational feedback. So, they already prepped this in 2020. Open global survey feedback, April, September of 2020. Gallup feedback, translation, cognitive interviews, cognitive, so psychological paradigm. Pilot testing and revision, January to July 2021. Keep that in mind. As early as March, they were already. Like, so, so, so they so let's see, they started this in 2021. But they were already talking about this even before. Look at this March March of 2020. So so that so that so that feedback was already you know could have been soon could have been a little sooner sooner than March. But even if it was just March, it's nuts, right? It's nuts, right? It's like just, just cons This is what I mean by cons this is what I mean. I believe in conspiracies. People getting together, secretly doing stuff, having insider inf information for an agenda while claiming they don't have an agenda. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a thing. You just gotta be careful with, you know, with all this, you know, with all this, you know, with all this nonsense that's going to cloud your judgment and end up having you look at scripture in a, you know, inside out. But yeah, it's crazy, right? This, once again, this is why for me, big emphasis on this is, do not love, love the world. Do not stake your future, your legacy in the ways and institutions of men. That's the thing, be, be 
Come on now, look at this. March, as you know, it's, it's, the development process began as early as far as we can tell as March 2020. Come on. Crazy. Oh yeah, flourishing assessment. So here's the assessment. Happiness and life satisfaction, meaning and purpose, mental and physical health, character and virtue, close social relationships, and financial and material stability. And remember, this is also include the role of religion as well. And how, whether or not you're saved is irrelevant. How, hey, if it helps you flourish, if we find a causation that helps you flourish, we're going to promote that. Yeah, remember, it's, yeah, remember, it's the United States. Remember, this is, bear in mind, this is one of the ideals of the, of the you know, country, you know, the freedom of, you know, religion. Well, it's a little hard to promote freedom of religion if you think. Meaning that you're, act you're actively going to, like, advocate some somebody else's faith if you think that it's false. Right? So, so of course, the only natural thing to do is, well, in that case, they're all technically right. Because, look, they help you flourish in some shape or form. So we're going to encourage that. Yay. Diversity, inclusion, and equity. Everybody just die. Okay. Questions in each of these six domains that form a flourishing index that we've been using extensively at Harvard in various settings ranging from workplaces to educational settings, clinical contexts, and numerous other settings uh, as well. However, our well-being assessment will this is van der Wheelies from Harvard. not be restricted to these 12 questions. We will have numerous other well-being questions, along with various questions concerning demographics, social and economic characteristics, questions on religion and spirituality. Yeah, by the way, they're collecting all this, think about it, all this personal data. All this personal data. If you look at the history of, uh, of psychological data used in, used in politics, they use that for a reason. Kind of like how, you know, Facebook and Amazon and all that, and all them collect your data too. Just as hoping that Eventually, you know, they could put something out there that's gonna grab your attention and keep steering you their direction. Yeah, what do you think they're gonna do with this later on? I can only imagine. You know, just basically appealing to the base man in some shape or form. On health, on character, on personality, family and childhood experiences, social and national political contexts. And so we'll be able to use this data um, to address questions concerning the key determinants of human flourishing. To address questions determining the key determinants of human flourishing, which are... Questions such as, how is it that religion or childhood experiences or family life or community or work or politics or economics or character affect human flourishing and how, how might this vary by country and by context critically to do so we truly need longitudinal data data on the same group of these 240,000 individuals over time cross-sectional data is not adequate to address these questions to see this for example we've known for a long time that marriage and happiness are correlated but is that because marriage contributes to happiness or is that because happy people are more likely to go on to get married with cross-sectional data we cannot tell likewise is religious participation associated with lower depression because religious service attendance protects against depression or is it because those who become depressed are more likely to withdraw from their religious communities and other forms of community life there is, in fact, evidence for both, but from cross-sectional data, we, again, cannot tell. We need this longitudinal data. So notice what he said. They've done studies on this before. This is a confession. He said it multiple times. We've studied all of this before, but really, we can't tell. He's confessing that essentially the scientific, the, soci the sociological 
the Statistical Community Academy establishment has overall failed. So we need this. How do you know you need this if what you had before was a failure, was, a, was apparently didn't help, didn't actually do us any good? When it's all said and done. Uh. Over time. And we'll be able to address these sorts of questions more broadly with multiple aspects of well-being, looking at numerous potential causes and factors that shape well-being in a variety of countries around the world. The Global Flourishing Study will thus fundamentally contribute to our understanding of the societal determinants of flourishing and deeply enrich our knowledge concerning how this might vary across cultural contexts and what might be universal. What may be good across cultural context and what might be universal? But these are, I hate to use the term for Freudian slip, but this confession, yeah, we don't really know anything about human nature. Like us scientists and academics, we don't know anything about human nature. What might be universal, we don't really have anything before that tells about what is both beneficial or good in any cultures or contexts. So hopefully this will help us especially with what might be universal. So there you go. You got people, you got the blind leading the blind. These people basically have nothing. He's basically confessing. We've had essentially nothing. Like I said, inconclusive. They've been working mostly with inconclusive data for decades, essentially for decades. And now it's, well, no, we need to do this thing we've never done before on a broader scale. We couldn't even figure it out with specifics. So we're doing it on a broader scale. And this is going to help us with our understanding. With that, I will hand things over to David Meller at the Center for Open Science. Yeah, David Meller, Center for Open Science. Let's skip ahead of that one. Center for Open Science, I said Council, sorry. Center for Open Science. Sorry, there's a lot of these groups. I get them mixed up every now and then. Easy for us to trick ourselves. This process of, of using the registry is critical to maximizing the credibility of our findings. Open science means being focused on getting it right. Open science means not being first, necessarily. It means approaching these questions with humility and willingness to have our answers checked and verified by others. And it means that the data that comes from all across the world is really going to be owned and really going to be shared by all of humanity. So, yeah, so everybody's going to have access to this data. So, so the goal is, or so they're working with the Center of Open Science, for open science. So then they can provide the means to facilitate the data that they collect over time and perhaps even to be cataloged with other data that corresponds to it perhaps as well. And if you look at educate, the GFS, so the Global Flourishing Study, will become a model for a large-scale longitudinal, sh you know, sharing and data analysis. Remember, this is the first study ever, and it will be the model. They haven't done it yet. They literally haven't completed the study yet, but it's going to be the model. Does that make any sense to to you? Yeah, there you go. Like, we, we're literally just experimenting. We're literally just testing this out. We haven't reached a conclusion yet, but it, it's going to be the model. This is the standard now. Why? Because it's Harvard and Baylor and everybody else. You know, it's like, hey, look, we got together. We consented to this. We think that this is ethically important for the situation and whatnot. No, we're not going to wait until the end of the five years to find out whether or not this should be the model. This is the model. This is, this is really too big of a moment. Uh, to go by the status quo, to follow the normal path. To go by the status quo, to follow the normal path. You mean actually testing it to its conclusion and then deriving it from... Okay, look, I teach junior high science, and supposedly the 
steps of scientific method are observation, hypothesis, experimentation, conclusion. And then whether or not your conclusion is, you know, conclusion uh, validates your hypothesis, you still gain knowledge, you still learn something. Notice, yeah, yeah, we're not going to wait for the, for the conclusion. We're just going to, this is going to be the norm. That's, this is how science works today, people. We're like, remember, this has nothing to, yeah, they say that there's no agenda. Really? There's no, there's no agenda. So why can't you just wait for the conclusion and then decide from there? No, because this is all about human flourishing. We want, we want to have a human, universal, humanitarian, you know, ecumenical, ethical world system. You know, this is we we, you know, we want Nimrod again. And basically, we want to make the world you know Babel again. If, you know, with this, so we got so we have time. Because think about it. After all, man is has character. Man is overall good. So we can trust each other in the long run, I guess, or something like. I don't know. It's just yeah, this it's the blind leading the, the blind and. You know, for anybody, for the church, for the church to want to partner with this is just, it's just, it. wow. I don't know what to call it. It's just, anywho, but in conclusion to this, you'll see this man again soon. For more information, if you want to check this out for yourself, Baylor ISR. Go to baylorisr.org slash global flourishing study. There's also Harvard Human Flourishing at hfh.fas.harvard.edu and then gallup.com slash ganalytics. There's also the Center of Open Science, cos.io. See where they currently are at. It is still going. I don't know how successful it is, because quite frankly, I don't believe in the, um, I don't believe in the efficacy <laughs> or the competence of modern science, because quite frankly, a lot of it is padding and projection. So anywho, so there's that. Before we go on. Let's go to Luke chapter 6, 17 through 28. And he came down with them and stood in a plain in the company of disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue. His goodness, his righteousness, his holiness, purity that is God Almighty, went virtue out of him and healed them all. I think what's really uh, just antagonizing rebellious man is that we cannot do what our Lord has done. And he will continue to do it when he comes back. In fact, he didn't even have to do it before the fall. I mean, death was a part of the equation, but hey, you know, when you turn when you trade paradise for a false for a for a false promise given to you by a creature in a, you know, just a creature, a fellow creature. I don't know, you know, it's like we reap what what we sow. I'm just glad the Lord's merciful and gracious. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the, 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 you know, the man, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading the. I'm in the wrong one. Okay, sorry. Still important though, because 
after he healed many people, he, he, took, he said this, and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Remember these words, people. Sermon, this is the key note of the Sermon on the Mount. This is how his sheep, this is how his disciples, this is how his followers, this is how the adopted children of God live. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And it's not this earth as we currently know it. There'll be a new one. And he will make it good. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. And this is a reference to Isaiah chapter 55. This is more spiritual than it's physical. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. But as I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. I'll stop there. If that other thing was all said and done, I should have no animosity towards these people. Even if they become my personal mortal enemies in the near future. The near future meaning my life, within my lifespan. Because <laughs> they could be 20 years from now. They'll be here before you know it. For after all, what do I got to lose? For them, everything for eternity. So thus I pray for their repentance, their salvation. May they join me in everlasting comfort and everlasting guidance by that of our Good Shepherd. In due time to be our King forever and ever. Amen. But for now, this is the false legacy. This is the vain attempt to recreate paradise. For four years now, almost four years, we have cast an ambitious vision for continuing our ascent toward becoming the preeminent Christian university in the world. And we aim for nothing less than that. Pepperdine University, this is the present of this year's annual so Pepperdine Associates Dinner. Contributors, donors, promoters of Pepperdine University, which is also a member of the CCCU, like Baylor University. Yep, preeminence. GCU, preeminence. Baylor University, preeminence. Pepperdine preeminence, number of other Christian colleges and universities, preeminence. Preeminence, preeminence, preeminence. And what's really interesting about Pepperdine is, face value, they seem to be the most, the most devout, the most orthodox, the most conservative out of a number of institutions, and they're based in California. But after what I've shown you from GCU and Baylor, Listen carefully. Discern. And understand what spirit he does us in. Of course, not the preeminence of which Christ speaks of. The one whom virtue came comes from. But is of an earthly, a carnal, a man-centered preeminence. And we do so, amen. 
We do so while staying true to the founding mission and principles that have so ably guided and inspired us this far. We have this ambitious vision because George Pepperdine and those who came after him taught us to dream, and they taught us to dream big. They built this institution on a foundation of first principles that have stood the test of time. As we together cast a vision for Pepperdine's future, we remain firmly rooted in those first principles while also continuing to climb. Tonight we're going to wander through Pepperdine's historical roots, these first principles that have shaped us and made us the institution we are today. These are the roots that feed our growth as we climb. They ground our innovations and creativity so that we remain deeply tied to our original identity. The roots, the roots. What did Christ say about roots in regards to how we find our identity and how we find our strength and direction? I'm the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me. These, these are man made, these are, these are cultivated roots for our own purposes. An identity that distinguishes us from all other universities in the world. An identity that distinguishes us from all other universities in the world. Sad to say, you're very much similar to a number of these universities. These first principles are faith, and truth, and excellence, and character. Faith, truth, excellence, character. If you're already seeing you know, connections, a couple of them at least, you've been paying attention. These are almost sound, sounding like four cardinal virtues. In fact, as I've studied George Pepperdine over the years, I'm astounded that his vision and these virtues are remarkably profound as a cure for the ills of modern culture now some 90 years later. The cures for modern, so, the, so these traditions, these principles are cures for modern culture. Faith, where there is fear. Truth, where there is deception. Excellence, where there is apathy and character, where there is self-promotion. Overall sounds pretty legitimate, right? Of course, the self-promotion thing is a little, um, dare I say, hip hypocritical. You'll see what I mean soon. And yet it remains our conviction that part of our core identity includes welcoming all students, no matter where they are in their faith, to a Christian university where they can encounter the life and love offered by Jesus Christ. Our job, and according to George Pepperdine, our first mandate is to create and sustain a culture where each of our students experiences the presence and power of God while at Pepperdine. So what does this look like? How is our first mandate being manifested at Pepperdine right now? And what does the future hold for Pepperdine's commitment to our faith? Let me talk about a few examples. Our students are flocking to the well. Our weekly worship experience in the middle of campus in our amphitheater. Worship service. One of our highest priorities is to create a worship culture across our campuses, and this flagship worship experience has become a great source of joy and meaningful fellowship for our students. So worship experience, joy and fellowship. Likewise, our student athletes worship together every Wednesday night in the Athletes' Chapel, where many of our athletes are growing stronger in their faith in praising God through victory and in the rare occasions where there's defeat. 
The Pepperdine Worship Summit, now in its fourth year, is the annual Another worship service, another experience. Kickoff event that proclaims to our community and to all of Southern California who we are at Pepperdine, a community powered by vibrant worship. And last year, just before this associate's dinner, we launched a new Center for Faith and the Common Good. Center for Faith and the Common Good. So right after talking about, yeah, we have three examples of how we promote a worship culture for, for remember, an experience. Not doctrine, not teaching, not understanding of the word and the will of the Lord God. Worship experience. Kind of like the Asbury re revival. Sorry, there is no doctrine, there is no repentance, there was no nothing there. It was just, in fact, there was a lot of ecumenism, as well as also diversity, inclusion, and equity when it came to things like sodomy, amongst other, amongst other you know, per you know, perversions and violations of the law as well, whether it be, quote, straight or gay. So, listen to that little part again. Vibrant worship. And last year, just before this associate's dinner, we launched a new Center for Faith and the Common Good. Center for Faith and the Common Good. This center is focused on demonstrating through evidence-based research and scholarship that a life of faith leads to individual human flourishing, and to societal good. Individual human flourishing and societal good based on what research? Science. Let's move on a little bit. Except in this world today, and perhaps over the course of human history as well. At Pepperdine, we define our academic process as the pursuit of truth. In fact, in our Pepperdine affirmations, as you probably all have memorized by heart, we declare that truth, having nothing to fear from investigation, should be pursued relentlessly in every discipline. As we all know, pursuing truth is not the same as simply watching our favorite echo chamber cable news channel. And with the rise of social media, the rise of social media, the truth is often hidden deep beneath the noise. George Washington once said, truth will ultimately prevail where there is pains to bring it to light. He wasn't the best grammarian. It makes a George Washington joke with grammar and everything. I'm just gonna skip over this part. It's, it's uh, pretty lame. True education brings truth to light. True education celebrates critical thinking and different views. Critical thinking and different views. In fact, different views does not necessarily mean Christian or biblical whatsoever. True education allows others to speak even when we don't agree with them. And true education challenges and supports students. It does not coddle them, and it does not infantilize them. And that's who we are at Pepperdine. Like I said, a merger of left and right wing, conservative and liberal, progressive and traditional. Oy, Hegelian dialectic, just crazy. Crazy how... Like, didn't, somebody tells me that George Hegel didn't create it, he just observed that it's what we do. <laughs> that it's just what we do. It's a natural, it's just a natural way of compromising in the, in the, in the, in the, in the you know, long term. It is precisely this rigorous civil dialogue where weak arguments and sloppy thinkings is exposed. Weak arguments and sloppy thinking. Not falsehood, not error, not lying, not deceit. Weak arguments, slop, weak and sloppy arguments. 
again, the elimination. Notice the elimination of so truth is not invaded. Truth is not uncovering, not exposing darkness, deception. What is not spoken in truth? No, no, exposes exposes sloppy and weak arguments. See that? It's, the, you know, it's that flourishing, it's that common good, it's that humanitarian, universalist, ecumenical ethics that whitewashes human depravity. As I've traveled the globe and immersed myself in different cultures, I've learned that we can share values and principles and still see things differently, approach things differently, experience things differently. The more I learn about other people and other cultures, the more I learn about myself and our culture. And in doing so, I find I have a genuine conviction to adopt what is good, indeed what is better, from other cultures. In Uganda, for example. Uganda, for example, he, as he says, you can watch this yourself, if, just trust me, it's 90% socializing 10% business and he says oh that's different blah blah that's in effect blah blah oh, I guess it's good it's all based on human relationships and everything you know it's yeah of course I would find it more credible if Uganda wasn't so politically and economically dysfunctional academic freedom and free of course not to say that our nation's not so <laughs> Oh well, well there's there's egg on our face. Oh, okay, there you go. Right, okay. I'll confess that it's definitely matter of nations. This is me taking this the log on my eye before I take out the spec. Never mind. <laughs> but you get my point in general. Speech are absolutely essential in the pursuit of truth. Okay, freedom of speech. You'll notice it's this conservative, but also this. -E At Pepperdine, we know our true north. Elements as well. And our true north doesn't need defenders. Truth stands on its own merits. We invite questions and scholarship and research and debate and dialogue. That's what a true university does. So we will engage with all beliefs, all faiths, all people in good faith and in pursuit of truth. All faiths, all people in good faith and in pursuit of truth. Yeah, according to scripture, you can't really do that when it's all said and done. What, you know, what fellowship does light have with darkness? With the living and the dead. And remember, it's not saying that, oh, I'm saved, I'm better than everybody. No, it's I'm alive. I can see. And that's by the grace of the Lord God, not by my own merit, not by my own works. Not by a long shot. Saved means that I was rescued from myself, from my sin, from my rebellion against the Lord. So, what fellowship is light have with darkness? And in that process, we will listen to those views with which we vehemently disagree, and we will be better and sharper for it. As uh, you might be wondering, you're just giving him a hard time and being unnecessary. Okay. So he has this, you know, spirituality. You know, he gets uh, faculty together of the Pepperdine to debate and discuss pertinent, controversial topics and issues. All sounds good, right? Great, wonderful. But there's one more thing he does as well. Force and free speech and other important topics necessary to counter the trends of cancel culture. We've hosted Robbie George and Cornell West and Jonathan Haidt. And just last week, John Clifton, the CEO. So let's see here. So. 
because remember, we want to avoid cancel culture, promote free speech. So let's see, what's, what's the title of this video? Flourishing Schools Part 3, Christian University Ecumenical Ethics. So let's see here, he invites on and promotes, like you should glean from this man, you should learn from them, take the good stuff, which is Platonic and, Aristot and, and Aristotelian. Very pagan. From Cornell West, who's Black Liberation Theology. Robert P. George, devout conservative Roman Catholic. Jonathan Hadid, atheistic Jew, and John Cl and John Clifton, who is the current CEO of Gallup, and yeah, he doesn't care much for the care, care, you don't know, care much for the preeminence of Jesus Christ, his word, or really anything in, in like relation to him. But yeah, you should learn truth from these men. Oh, of Gallup who spoke about the global rise of unhappiness and what we can do to engender excellence in all aspects of our lives, which brings me to my third virtue of excellence. Steve Jobs once said, be a yardstick of quality. Some people aren't used to an environment where excellence is expected. Steve Jobs, was an, Steve Jobs was an Antichrist figure who took micro doses of LSD to help inspire him. Yeah, I kid you. No, that's literally a thing. Like that's actually people who people who promote and look up to the man. Like, yeah, they, they, I mean, who know his biography, biographical, you know, know his life, know his biography. Yeah, that's that's that you know that's a thing. You you will find that information easily. But that's precisely who we are at Pepperdine. That's what we're pursuing, an environment where excellence is expected. Why? Well, because that's what God expects of us. Philippians 4.8, a familiar text to most of you, is becoming a banner verse for us. Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is... Finally, brothers and sisters, see... Right wing, left wing, conservative in, inter, intersectionality. True. Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Okay, so this is where the King James and a few other translations come in. I know what friendly is using, don't care. Because look, this is what it says. So Philippians 4 8. So finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are of good report. So, so far, pretty similar, right? If there be any virtue, remember, virtue isn't just something done well, it's something that's done right. Some, it's, you know, it's the right thing to do. And this is virtue in the, remember, it's virtue in the old sense, this is virtue in the biblical sense, and remember, the same virtue in reference to Christ. There anything so so if there's any should there be any virtue so that which is what by default Christ like that is good in the eyes of the Lord and if there be any praise think on these things so it's quite interesting really that for this translation it's excellence if there be any excellence so anything that's done effectively, efficiently. No, no, no. It's not talking about that. It's talking about what is good, what is righteous, what's holy. If there is any virtue. Whatsoever things are, if there, if there be any virtue, if there any virtue. It's quite strange, right? This is the one time, this is the, this is the key difference between him 
Baylor and this, you know, him, you know, him, Baylor and uh, definitely GCU <laughs> replacing. All right, in this case, it's not, it's not virtue. It's not what you should let's do. That's good. That's Christ-like. It's what's excellent. So, Pepperdine's uh, that'll be a little bit more on the, a little bit more on the mammon side of things. It's all said and done. Anywho. We define excellence at Pepperdine as giving God our very best, the first fruits of our lives. Even before a single student stepped onto Pepperdine's campus, George Pepperdine cast a vision for excellence, saying, young men and women in this institution will be given educational privileges equal to the best. And Wait until you see what these educational privileges are and what marks Pepperdine as a preeminent Christian institution. Higher education today, we are a top-tier academic institution and the highest-ranked Protestant university in the country. And that's not all. What else, what else makes Pepperdine preeminent? Oh, yeah, right here. Well, yeah, the faculty, I literally don't even know what this woman does. Like, what, like, is she a music teacher, theology teacher, English teacher? I don't know. In each of our schools that rival the most prestigious universities in the world. We are about to break ground on the mountain at Mullen Park, our world-class student village with a state-of-the-art fitness center, a 3,500-seat arena with restaurants and terraces and a stunning view that creates an ambiance for community and connection. In fact, as you've heard before, the namesake of... Okay, so yeah, so, so non-academic infrastructure. Okay, and that's not all. The Chateau d'Hauteville, near Lake Geneva in Switzerland, is a new university campus. Words do not do this justice to the grandeur of the property and to the global convening power that it offers. 67 acres, built in 1760, owned by one family the entire time. The lightning rods on the roof were made by and given to them by Ben Franklin. I'm not making this up. And then he's going to go to, to athletics and, and the arts. What a country. <laughs> and at Pepperdine, we cannot speak of excellence without mentioning our athletics and our arts. Last year, for the fourth time. Last year, for the fourth time in Pepperdine's history, we won the Director's Cup for Division I AAA, which is a... Okay, here's, okay, in case you didn't know my perception of organized sports, or especially competitive, organized, highly organized competitive sports, I think it's just Greco-Roman garbage, but, you know... Sorry, like, you dedicate your time, life and time, on a field, court, the ball. You claim it's for the glory of God. I'm, I'm, I'm really having a hard time following. Especially with the way this man prays. I mean, he just keeps going on about the uh, athletics. See, you know, like, so, and these numbers show uh, the top 25 in the U.S., so, so look, see, she showcases women's soccer, the golf teams. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, the water polo, women's volleyball, men's volleyball. Let's see, and it keeps going. Yeah, women's, t women's, men's tennis, women's volleyball. Oh, okay, I guess the other one wasn't volleyball. Whatever. Oh, it's beach volleyball. There's, there's, there's actually a difference, believe it or not. <laughs> beach volleyball. So, yeah, just praises the sports. Just loves the sports. It's preeminence of the, of the school. is just... All right, let's go to... Yeah, so enough of that nonsense. And then... Oh, yeah, the arts. You got guitar... Dancing, all that jazz.
Yeah, it mentions it briefly, but not for long. I am endowing this institution to help young men and women prepare themselves for lives of usefulness in this competitive world and to help them build a foundation of Christian character and faith which will survive the storms of life. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know, the. F I really don't know, okay, I should have looked into it, but I don't know much about the background of George Pepperdine, as far as how his faith, but, yeah, this is a pretty worldly statement. I am endowing this institution to help young men and women to prepare themselves for lives of usefulness in this competitive world, which sounds nice until you read the rest of regards to their spirituality, and help them build a foundation of Christian character and faith which will survive the storms of life. Yeah, so you just, you just need to be survive the storms of life and just be useful. Explains the current state of the university, but then again, that's how it's... Yeah, it, was a, it wasn't meant to be a seminary or Bible college by like a, or a mission school by a long shot, so, and you included that, but it wasn't its sole purpose when Everdyne first started. All right, let's see here. College is an indispensable opportunity to build character. Tell me about it. Yeah, living with 18 to 22 year olds. Great time to build some character. I don't recommend it, okay? I did it. I did it. And I consider my dorm life experience pretty tame and pretty mild compared to most people's. I don't recommend it. So, yeah, it talks about the character character of, uh, and comes the academics, really the only thing that stands out is the character and the qualifications of the faculty. But I think this is the important part that we need to focus on here. Education is founded upon the promise of interpersonal, life-on-life -life relationships with professors. Professors with tried and tested character and passion, walking with students through the high-performative time of emerging adulthood. Pepperdine is generating leaders, brilliant leaders of faith and character and courage and creativity. Our children are worth it. Our communities are worth it. This nation is worth it. Our world is worth building character. And we remain committed to it at Pepperdine. I remember my mentorship. You hear what he said? Let's read this. Listen to that again. Our world is worth building character, and we remain committed to it at Pepperdine. Our world is worth building character. See, that's where it ties back into GCU and to a degree with Baylor. And all they're, and all they're like. Because bear in mind, before we, before we watch the conclusion that really sums it all up, this is once again. This isn't just restrained to these three. In fact, I'm gonna put a link, a link down below. Pepperdine is currently in partnership with Baylor, with the same man who's who's representing Baylor for the Global Flourishing Study, and as of as of recently as of this year, this year they're partnering for that research. He already said so. Yeah, partnering with Baylor, and remember, Baylor is who partnered with who? Harvard, Gallup, and the COS, Center of Open Science. I mean, this very much seems, Pepper I seem very much like it's more conservative right wing, but nonetheless has the spiritual charismatic appeal of that of Asbury University, which is also a member of the CCCU. Calvin University in Michigan, which has already has ecumenical programs, including that in, including the Lumen Institute, which trains, which trains teachers, which also includes instruction from Roman Catholic monks in the monastery. Some rather uh, new agey Roman Catholic monks at that. There's also King College in New York. And I tell you, that is a very Western, 
classical looking college. I mean, they, I mean, they even have uh, houses like the you know houses like the yeah, like the old school groups named after figures like Churchill, Susan B. Anthony, Bonhoeffer, etc. But nonetheless, they have they promote a light version of DIE because you know it's New York City. It's gonna be a more you know, still be a on the you know, progressive side. They also they also have their own you know their own institute their own uh, you know you know department of flourishing and there's well there's, there's as well as Fuller Theological Seminary they emphasize thrive but nonetheless thrive is likewise from the psychological paradigm integrated with that of their theology think about it Fuller the- Theological Seminary and they have a psychological department influencing their theology. Interesting, right? As well as a host of other universities as well. Wheaton College. As far as I can tell, I have no idea what any of this is. Flourishing and all that jazz is, but nonetheless, heavily, heavily subscribes to DIE as well. So, are there universities out there that don't that currently don't go into this? Yes, there are. I'm not going to tell you what they are though, because if you plan, because I'm already I'm already showing to you what you should be mindful of after you're mindful of pursuing the things of the Lord God, pursuing His Word, pursuing His seeking His face. But you're mindful of what's out there. Because regardless, wherever you think you want to go, you should you should not assume that, oh, it's a Christian college, it's quote unquote you know, conservative. Look at look at that. This is Pepperdine is one of the more more face value conservative colleges, especially for California. But yet, look what's happening. So be wary, people. Be be wary discern study look for yourself i do not recommend i do not promote going to higher education including christian universities and colleges but if you believe that's where the lord's leading you do your due diligence do your due diligence don't don't be like these people and just you know, do, do, and just in good faith because you know you're because you're a higher educational institution, a Christian one at that. I'm gonna just gonna just gonna go to your college or send my kid to your college and not even think twice about it. No, can't afford to do that anymore, people. Never could, and especially in this day and age, don't be a fool, please. Please don't be a fool. All right, let's go to the conclusion of this. Um, among the children. Of men. Oh, sorry about that. Went a little too far. He said, "In this way, we do our." Sm-. George Pepperdine closed his dedicatory address by encouraging the Pepperdine community to dedicate ourselves anew to the great cause of beautiful Christian living. He said, "In this way, we do our small bit to glorify the name of God in the earth and to extend His kingdom among the children of men." As I close, let me remind you of something that you already know. Pepperdine is a light. Our students, each and every one of them, is a light to the world. A light of faith, of truth, of excellence and character. All of this because of God's grace and faithfulness and because of the vision and fortitude of his servant, George Pepperdine. May God continue to shine his grace and favor upon Pepperdine. God bless you. Let's end with this. 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. 
grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue meaning what whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises which are that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust lust of the flesh lust of the eyes partaking of the divine nature Oh, we can rule, oh, because we can become like God and, and, and live, flourish and blah, blah, blah. No. Don't think it, don't think it like a man. Put on the spirit, put on the mind of Christ. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. So add to your faith, add to your belief, doing good works, doing what is Christ-like, doing what our Lord would do. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. My dear brethren, I impart to you that as we embark in the growth of our knowledge, the things of our Lord, as we proceed, as we press on in His name, for His glory, and His glory means for the promotion of His Word. Even even as him, even as him, even as he did, even when faced from the opposition of spiritual, of religious, of church establishments, of authorities, at the, at the chagrin, to the annoyance of the ambitions of the agendas of men, that we be spoken ill of, if not harassed, if not persecuted, even unto death on the cross. I do not know what the future holds for each of you, or for myself. I don't know when Christ shall return, or when the tribulation, the beginning of the beast, will reign. All I know is, I have his marching orders. And it gives me peace. And it will sustain me no matter what comes. For we are freed from the corruption of this world, of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and as well as the pride of life. We have life abundant, eternal, everlasting. Wherever you are in your stage of life, continue to learn and grow, but grow in the pursuit of the face and the word for the glory of our Lord God. This is Christian M.C. Fulmer. Signing out.